Morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us for uh, this event. We've been looking forward to uh, uh, honoring Frank Vogel and the book that he has uh, uh, produced. Frank um, is uh, an economics journalist, former director of um, uh, information and public affairs at the World Bank, and a founding um, uh, member of Transparency International together with Peter Eigen and served as vice chairman of Transparency International for many years and continues to serve on the um, uh, advisory uh, panel of Transparency International. Uh, Frank has seen this organization develop a worldwide presence over uh, just a few years and has seen it make an enormous uh, impact. Waging War on Corruption is Frank's third uh, book, and it is a stunner. I recommend it in the highest uh, 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 way possible. It's full of stories of, uh, of corruption and those who fight corruption. Frank writes about the heroes in this struggle. Um, he is uh, one of the great heroes in this struggle and doesn't uh, include himself uh, and very well could do so. Uh, I particularly like the two chapters on villains, the uh, political and commercial villains that, uh, uh, that Frank uh, writes about. You have to have a sense of humor in this, in this business. Um, after Frank has uh, made some comments, uh, our other two uh, panelists um, will speak for three or four minutes, and then we will throw it open to um, uh, questions which I will ask, and finally, uh, questions from the audience. Ted Greenberg served in the U.S. Justice Department for 30 years. He was a member of delegations to the Financial Action Task Force in Paris, the Global Anti-Money Laundering Standards Center, um, and he was senior counsel in the Legal Vice Presidency uh, Office of the World Bank, and he now continues his work on these kinds of issues uh, with his own firm, TG Global, based here in Washington. Jean Pym uh, is coordinator of the World Bank's uh, STAR initiative, the Stolen Assets Recovery uh, Initiative. Uh, this is, many of you know, is an effort to help countries recover um, resources that have been stolen and shipped uh, abroad. Uh, this has become especially important in the Arab Spring, as we look for and hopefully find some of the assets of the Gaddafi family, uh, the Ben Ali's, and um, uh, the Mubarak family. Um, Frank, I am a longtime admirer of yours, and it's my great pleasure to introduce you this morning. Oh, thank you very, very much, Raymond. Um, Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for, for hosting this. Um, Raymond and his colleagues have done a tremendous job, and Raymond is uh, featured in the book um, several times. I, I won't give you the page references, but uh, because global financial integrity and the work that Raymond and his colleagues have pioneered uh, has made a tremendous difference in shaping an international debate, and from that shaping, we get international action. And this book is very much about action. It is about uh, people, it is about challenges, and it is about hope. It is dedicated to the colleagues who I've had the great privilege to work with in two organizations. One is Transparency International that you've heard about, and the other is the Partnership for Transparency Fund. Uh, we will gladly give you the brand new annual report. PDF is based here in Washington and supports individual projects done by civil society organizations right across the developing world. Let me, instead of getting into the deep substance, because it's a rainy, morning and you're still got your heads full of last night's debate. So let me, instead of getting into the deep substance, let me present to you some of the themes of this book in a different way. Let me talk about my anger, my passion, and also about my great joy. Um, 
Today, our focus is on illicit financial flows, but to understand that, you have to understand the broader context in which it plays out. Let me start with anger. A couple of years ago, I was at a dinner of the leaders of the largest banks in Latin America, and the guest speaker that night was the uh, Nobel laureate Mario Vargas Loja, who decided, rather to the surprise of the bankers, to talk about corruption. And he said to them, the biggest, one of the biggest problems in Latin America is complacency about the problem of corruption. People took it for granted. People weren't doing enough about it. And he berated the bankers. It was a, it was a marvelous evening. Let me try and shake your complacency a bit. This town is full of people who like to write about corruption, and once they've finished the manuscript, they think they've solved the problem. We need activists. This town is full of people, uh, including some, obviously not those present, some at aid agencies who are involved in putting out enormous sums of money in the name of improving, quotes, good governance, but don't really look further to see how much of that money has actually been stolen. This town is full of political pundits who watched last night's uh, presidential debate, a debate where the word corruption wasn't mentioned. And you're going to say, well, why should it have been mentioned? And the answer is very simple. There was a Gallup poll a couple of months ago that said Americans are more concerned about corruption in the federal government than about anything else except for job creation. They're more concerned about corruption in the government than social security, terrorism, even the budget. There wasn't a word last night about it. How do we clean up our corrupt political system that's created so much distrust and cynicism? There's nothing you'll find, I'm sure, in the commentary and the pundits this morning about it. We seem to just take it for granted, even though people are extraordinarily upset about it. I'm angry about the villains that uh, Ray just, Raymond just mentioned in the book, because in Afghanistan and in Iraq, billions of dollars of your taxpayer money, US taxpayer money, has simply been stolen, and far too little has been done about it. I'm annoyed about the villains engaged in every aspect of illicit financial flows who have created as a result an enormous amount of international insecurity. I could go on about my anger, but let me talk also about my passion. I'm passionate, and it comes through in the book, about the victims of corruption. For every single penny that is stolen by somebody in government as they abuse their office for their personal gain, there is a victim. For every bribe that is paid by a corporation to a foreign government to get a contract, there is a victim. You know, if you look at the FCPA settlements of many, many of the cases in this country, you won't find a single word about the victims. Can you imagine a murder trial where they don't mention the name of the person who was murdered? But FCPA cases, oh, they forget about the victims. Judges make rulings on those cases. They don't even consider the victims. But there are always victims. There are children who don't go to school because of the corruption of their government. There are families who don't have sanitation because of the corruption of their officials. In a survey done by Transparency International of over 100,000 people in 100 countries, top of the list came corruption or extortion by the police. I'm very angry about these villains, and that was one of the main reasons for writing this book. I'm passionate to support the victims of corruption. And I hope all of you, by the time we finish this morning, will be equally passionate. Let us also not forget the officials and the bankers in money center banks. These people who have signed all sorts of nice agreements about how they're going to impose you know, know your customer rules, how they are going to clamp down on offshore centers and all the rest of it. What have they really done? They know the problem, but they've done far, far too little. 
Let's think about all these cases recently about money laundering by major banks. Can any of you mention a single CEO of a major international bank that has paid hundreds of millions of dollars in fines that has even lost his job? Most of those CEOs are not even mentioned in the cases themselves. So I am passionate about getting justice for the victims of corruption. But let me also tell you about my joy, about this whole situation. Why am I a happy guy as a result of telling you about my anger and telling you about the passion that I have relative to the victims? It's because we have, across the world, in a large number of people, particularly civil society activists, public prosecutors, and investigative journalists who are risking their lives every single day to try to speak truth to power, to mobilize public opinion, to get mass movements going. My joy at seeing the enormous courage of thousands of people in Tunisia and in Egypt in January of last year who faced the brutality and the guns of the security police in their countries to go out in the street to demonstrate for their dignity, for their self-respect, and against illegit illegitimate corrupt governments. There is a tremendous sense of joy when you look at how much these people have achieved. Now, many people are not adequately aware of the record. So let me go back to let's say that period from the fall of the Berlin Wall to the rise of the Arab Spring, about 20 years. 20 years ago, there wasn't a single international civil society movement engaged in corruption. And when a group of us sat around a small table to say we are gonna create an organization, Transparency International, uh, we were depicted by some as sort of rather silly dreamers there was a cartoon in The Economist of uh, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, and we were thought of as, you know, just, just being idealistic. Today, there are 100 national chapters of Transparency International around the world. There are thousands of people who are engaged in the movement, and that's the tip of the iceberg because PTF has given over 200 grants uh, to civil society organizations in many countries. In fact, there are today hundreds of civil society organizations engaged in, cor in fighting corruption. 20 years ago, there was hardly an academic in this field. You could have counted them on a couple of hands. Today, the Transparency International Research Network has 5,000 subscribers. We've created a growth industry. 20 years ago, there was not a single anti-corruption international convention. And there were very few national laws in the uh, developed OECD countries. Today, there's a whole host of those conventions. And there is an increasing pressure to get them enforced. It's a slow process, but there is movement. 20 years ago, there was not a single international official organization that was willing to even acknowledge the problem of corruption. One of the reasons we started Transparency International was because Peter Eigen and I came from the World Bank, which absolutely refused to deal with the issue. Today, the World Bank, the United Nations, the OECD, and a whole set of the major international organizations all have policies that they claim are priorities, and in some cases, they really are priorities, to do something about corruption. 20 years ago, the amount of public awareness of this issue compared to today was really very, very small. We've seen an incredible increase in media attention on the problem spread through the internet, thread, spread through social media. We've seen organizations like Global Witness, ProPublica, Global Integrity, all moving out there, increasing the public attention on this. If you put all of these things together and you see how mass movements are being created if you look at the tens of thousands of people who, can, who are now going to demonstrations in India, you look at the brave people even who are demonstrating in Belarus of all places, uh, you look at all of that and you put it all together and you can see why I believe that there is reason to be very hopeful that we can in fact win this war against corruption. 
let me just say to you that we're going to win it because the heroes of this book are so, so important. You know, I get the inspiration. Why did I write this book? Well, I was inspired by people like Jose Ugaz, who was one of the prosecutors of Fujimori in Peru. And when I sent him the manuscript and said, could you review this, please, Jose, and perhaps um, write an endorsement, which he did, he wrote back and he said, um, I'd love to do it, but I'm quite occupied at the moment because they've just found a bomb under my car. <laughs> he still reviewed the book. I wrote to Elena Panfilova in Moscow, um, a dear friend, who is regularly followed by security police, whose computers are re constantly hacked, who knows of friends who have been beaten up and in some cases murdered in Russia, and yet she continues to fight for Transparency International Russia and lead it very, very courageously. You cannot look at what these people are trying to do in their countries and believe that nothing really is going to change, that complacency is in order. So this book is largely about that. Let me finally talk briefly about illicit financial flows, which after all is the central theme of global financial integrity. You know, there's a lot of detail in the book, not nearly uh, enough, of course, on this subject. But let me just, instead of getting into detail, because we've got this brilliantly expert panel, let me just mention a general subject. One of the incredible changes uh, in recent years has been that the group of 20 at their summits has also looked at the issue of corruption, something that us dreamers 20 years ago would never have imagined. And they have produced in the last two summits anti-corruption action plans. Those plans include significant detail on illicit financial flows. They talk about the offshore money, uh, um, offshore money centers. Uh, they talk about all the, about repatriation of stolen assets. They talk about many of the things that are on the lists that Raymond Baker and Global Financial Integrity have been putting together, promoting, and developing, and pushing. Um, that rhetoric is fascinating. It's terrific. It's a milestone. Uh, people like Crick Portman sitting at the very back, who was fortunately our Deputy Managing Director at TI for a few years, was very involved with it, helping us to get a group together to push for this sort of thing. But the rhetoric is far ahead of the action. These governments of the G20 are not yet walking the walk. They talk greatly, but what is really happening? Mr. Mubarak's family still controls its assets in London, despite everything that has happened. The Abacha family of Nigeria still managed to keep a huge amount of money of that uh, Sonia Obacha, the former president of Nigeria, stole, even though everybody knew about the situation. The Swiss authorities seem only to discover that there are stolen assets by heads of government after those heads of government have been thrown out of office. I could go on, but the point I'm trying to make is we know what needs to be done on illicit financial flows. We have fantastic research thanks to Raymond and, and to others and to his colleagues. We have the lists of the action plans. We have the institutions. And yet, we don't yet have sufficient willpower on the part of governments. That is going to change. That is part of our challenge. This is only an interim book. The next volume is going to not simply say waging war on corruption, but how we won the war on corruption. We have reached base camp but we still have an Everest of corruption <coughs> to climb. I want to just end with one very simple quote, if I can find it in my, my papers here. It is from James Baldwin, who wrote after the Civil Rights Movement about how, to quote him, the people that once walked in darkness are no longer prepared to do so. I think that's very apt for talking about those who were in 
the Arab Spring, those who are demonstrating across the world, those who are confronting illegitimate governments. Those who are fighting today for freedom, for justice, for transparency, for government accountability. Those who are fighting for the dignity of the individual, for self-respect, and against thuggish official corrupt governments who coerce and extort. Those people, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope you too, are on the right side of history. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frank, for those inspiring words. And thank you for drawing attention to the victims of corruption, which we too often uh, um, uh, elide over and failed to, uh, to recognize. The formative experience for me was 15 years that I lived in Nigeria. Um, I call Nigeria in my own book the most corrupt country in the world, and then I go on to explain how I can possibly make such a bold statement. But uh, uh, in the analysis that we do of illicit f uh, financial flows out of Africa, uh, we estimate that half of it comes out of Nigeria alone. I know people in Nigeria who are living at a lower standard today than they were when I met them in 1961, victims of, of the huge resources stolen through corrupt uh, uh, practices and taken out of the country. Um, Ted, um, please give us three or four minutes of comments, um, and then we'll go on to Jean. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to just, you brought up uh, Nigeria. Let me just mention, uh, you know, the former managing director of uh, Nigeria, uh, 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 Mrs. Uh, Konjo Awela, uh, Ngozi Okonjo Awela, who Jean will talk about in the context of uh, starting the STAR initiative at the bank, is now the uh, finance minister. She previously was the finance minister as well as the foreign minister of Nigeria. She was the one tasked by President uh, Obasanjo, uh, almost alone, to go chase the Abacha money that had been stolen. And uh, we have to thank her and very brave other people, as you talk about, um, Frank, for getting some of this started. Uh, where it will end, uh, we don't know. Uh, I'll give you one quick example of a prosecutor in Uganda. Uh, one of 12 children, only one ever to have gone to college, serves in the uh, prosecutor's office, uh, tries to prosecute some fraud cases involving senior government officials who receive bribes. And I'm talking with him one day, and I'm pushing him, why don't you do more, do more, prosecute these people. And he said, wait a minute, you don't understand. We're still in, they're still finding bodies from the killing fields of Idi Amin and places I can, otherwise I'm dead. Uh, this is in Uganda. Uh, he says, I'm dead, they'll kill me, uh, and then they'll uh, kill my family. We sitting in the United States have a little bit of a, a different perspective. When I was a prosecutor for many years, when I got death threats, I called the FBI or the Secret Service or the US Marshals, and uh, enveloped in the protective umbrella. I didn't have to, all I had to do was worry about my job, doing my job. I didn't have to worry about the uh, car exploding in the morning. And I think these are very important issues because when we, we talk about governments, the question is, you know, what are governments doing? A lot of things have changed, but a lot of things remain the same. The windows of political opportunity open and close. On corruption, they were closed for quite a bit as the world dealt uh, post 9-11 uh, with the effects of terrorist financing and, and terrorism. And during that period of time, at least sitting in my perspective, uh, uh, it, in the US government and other places, nobody was interested to deal with corruption because they had other priorities. It is now a priority to be dealt with. And we have that support from the G20 uh, and it's very interesting that it's broadened from the G7 and the G8. Now the moving force uh, is the G20, and hopefully that will expand to others. I take your point. Action plans, you know, the Sea Island Summit, I think that was uh, Carter. Um, 
Yeah, everybody comes out with action plans. The G8, the G7 had lots of action plans. And then when we turned around to implement some of the action plans, we couldn't because not all of the G8 countries trusted each other. That, now, that is somewhat dated. Question is now, I don't, I don't like the analogies to war because, it's, but where are the boots on the ground? Where are the people on the ground? I want to come to some specific things, but you mentioned um, uh, Obama. They, they've taken some very specific steps at the, uh, in the Justice Department. Uh, Attorney General Holder announced a kleptocracy initiative to go after sitting heads of state and senior officials who are moving money through the United States, which are the proceeds of corruption and other crimes. Uh, uh, he spoke recently at the Arab Forum, uh, run by, uh, put together by the uh, uh, G7 and the G20 and the World Bank. And he said he's now assigning prosecutors to work in the region. Uh, the United Kingdom is also putting somebody to work there in the region. These are the kinds of things that I think can be very helpful. I already got one minute. That's how long <laughs> I've talked. Oh, I, I, OK. Then I'll come back to other things later. Um, I want to talk about social media for a second, or, or a couple seconds, 60, if I may. Uh, because I think that it's extraordinarily important. And if bankers aren't scared now, they ought to be. If the corrupt officials aren't scared at what happened in Tahrir Square and what happened in the other countries, they ought to be quaking in their boots. Many of you saw, I'm sure, the Joseph Coney 2012 tape that came up on Twitter about that whack job that uh, calls what he uh, has the Lord's Resistance Army, the so-called uh, uh, liberation movement, which is really a terrorist organization that takes children and uses them in as soldiers or as, as child slaves. 16,000 hits on YouTube on the first day. Five days later, 100 million viewers. Why did it go viral? Oprah Winfrey tweeted something. Facebook has 901 million monthly active users. Um, how does this kind of thing, uh, Twitter has a billion active users. How does this fit into, into the world? Let me just try and put it in the context of population. China has a billion three hundred and thirty-six million seven hundred and eighteen or thereabouts. India uh, uh, people, India a billion one hundred and eighty-nine thousand one hundred and seventy-two. Twitter has a billion active users. They have power. They have power of the electronic media to move things instantly around the world. Facebook, if you're looking at numbers. Facebook is the, is the next down at uh, 901 million users, YouTube at 800 million users, users, and then comes the United States. If you are ranking countries of population at 313 uh, odd million people. This, uh, the anti-banker sentiment that uh, arose after the financial crisis, we've seen some of it uh, in, in the, uh, in the demonstrations, what have you, in the United States, I, I know from friends in Europe that it is much greater there. There is a tremendous resentment. Uh, because where is all the corrupt money banked? As you say, in the banks. Um, and the big problem is we keep going to the old stock of cases. Uh, Mubarak is the old guys, like Marcos. Where are the new dictators putting their money? Are they in the same banks? They got to be. So, uh, uh, but the problem we have, and I'll close on this because my minute's opening. According to the Economist Intelligence Unit, we only have uh, 25 full democracies in the, United, in, the, in, in the world today. We've got a long way to go uh, to fight the corruption, but it's got to be done by uh, brave individual people working with champions in each government, and then banding together, because there is no corruption case today that doesn't have an international aspect to it. Thank you, Ted. Jean, three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Thanks, Raymond, and thank you very much for the invitation and quite honored to be uh, associated to this event. I've been knowing Ted for 12 years, and he's always been a long speaker, so I try to stick to my three minutes. Um, firstly, it's going to be a bit difficult not to seem a bit lame after such passionate statement by Frank and Ted, um, and I would try also with more bureaucrat perspective to convey a bit of that passion. Uh, three things uh, to begin with. Uh, first, what you said at the outset, that corruption is not a victimless crime, is extremely important, and we continue to hear that. All this financial crime is victimless, and we need to put a public face on all this, and I think what has happened over the last year and, and the Arab Spring is a very, very strong way to show that there is a di direct impact, and there are victims to corruption. And that's one of the reasons why every morning we're waking up and going to work to try to do something and make a difference. Now, at the same time, reading the book, sometimes you're a bit overwhelmed by the challenge. I mean, I think you use the uh, image of the Everest of anti-corruption. We are just at Spade Camp. It's a Sisyphean effort. I think we all feel that every day, and it's extremely daunting sometimes. But that's why we also need that passion, and we need to bring all the pieces together. The push from civil society, more demand. Sometimes, yeah, they may be a bit too ambitious, but it's very important to have that pressure. And I think uh, looking at the book and the perspective that you draw also, I mean, been working on that for 12 years, having seen that from other sides, there are a couple of things that come out. The first one is that there is a re really strong and powerful demand for good governance and anti-corruption. And I think the way it has expressed itself in the Arab Spring was particularly compelling, but this is something that existed before that needs to be sustained. And I think it's going to drive things going forward in a very interesting and important way. The second element is the leadership by key individuals and organizations. I mean, you need people to be champions at, and to push. And the last element, and that's where things come together in a very important way, is there are structural changes and systemic changes that sustain that. I mean, if it's only a couple of individuals, it not, it's not going to, to be sustainable. And I think making sure that all these pieces come together is one of the key challenges going forward. Um, if I may, two, two comments on two elements. First, to talk a little bit about the Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative and, and, and as an example of how we are trying to get things together. As Ted mentioned, Gozi from, from Nigeria was at the genesis of that. Interestingly, it brings together two of the organizations that Frank is mentioning in his book, trying to work together in a more down-to-earth and practical way on anti-corruption issue, the UN and, and the World Bank. And what we are trying to do is a mix of knowledge um, there is a little underestimation sometimes of how difficult it is to go from the international instruments to practice on the ground. I mean, you can go and see a prosecutor in Tunisia saying you have ANCAC. They don't care about ANCAC because ANCAC is not a tool. They need to know how to do it, and it's very down to earth. And it's how do you trace assets? What kind of evidence do you need? And get people to be able to do it by themselves and push the envelope. And this is what we are trying to do every day so that they have the capacity by themselves to do it. And not just, we want to do it, but we don't know how to do it. And that we hope that it's going to make a difference even though it's going to be extremely long. Now, if I take the example of what's happening in, in the Arab uh, region, uh, the Arab Forum that Ted mentioned that the G8 and the Deauville partnership with our support organized uh, two weeks ago, I think we saw there something very interesting which is, very strong political momentum, but at the same time in a way that can be used to hold them to account. What have you done? You promised, what have you done? Bring together policy people and practitioners. These are two different worlds that do not work together enough, and therefore the practitioners say, I've, in, I've impediments, what can I do about it? But if the, if the policy people are not in the room, it's not going to change. On the other hand, what we see is policy people making claims and promising things, but not making sure that the practitioners have the tools and the resources. So really bringing these people together in the same room was very important. And the last piece, which is very down to earth, and that's our day-to-day -day work, is building trust between people. A UK uh, prosecutor is not going to have an informal discussion and help an Egyptian practitioners if they have not met, if they don't know each other, if they have not been able to have a discussion. So, I mean, in Doha, we organize more than 30 bilateral discussions between those countries and those practitioners just to help build that momentum and have the people be able to take, pick up their phone and say, listen, I've got a problem, I need your help. What's the best way for me to send your request so that it works? And I think that's that mix of policy practitioners and, and, and momentum momentum and providing the tools uh, that is very important. Now, the other element of STAR uh, that we are trying to, to promote, and that's where from a bank perspective it's a bit unusual, we are also going back to the financial centers and say, guys, you're not doing your job. And you have promised to do that. You have made commitments. Please deliver. 
and usually our, our counterpart are the developing countries, and suddenly we are making it also a financial center, developed countries issue, and I think that's very important to continue in that respect. A lot needs to be done. I mean, clearly we have a huge agenda in front of us, but I think having that uh, authorizing environment to be able to do that and to push the envelope was very important. The G20, I mean, I'm, what you said about the G20 was extremely interesting and important, and, and in the book, including the fact that it's been a bit underestimated, in particular, by the media and the outside world, how much this could be meant, made meaningful. I mean, it could stay words on a piece of paper, but if there is really a call to the G20, what have you delivered? Okay, you had an action plan. You have your self-monitoring. Question it. Is it really providing uh, evidence that things are moving in the right direction would be very important. And I think the other benefit of the G20, I happen to sit in the technical working group of the G20 working on this, is that bring in the same room practitioners and policymakers from both the former G7 and developing countries and the big one, the emerging markets, is absolutely critical because they are also the challenge of tomorrow. Having Russia, having China really adhering to these instruments is extremely important. So you can have that on a piece of paper, but having the discussion between the practitioners on uh, what does that mean in practice, how do you do it, how do you measure your impact, and how do you do monitoring reports that are meaningful is important. So just pick up an example at Los Cabos, uh, the issue they made public, asset tracing review country by country. We were instrumental in trying to get that done. And, and, and I think having China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, some of these countries accepting the public scrutiny of this is, these are the tools we have and how we use them or not is very important. Last point, you said action. I think one of the critical elements of all this, it's very nice to have the international convention, it's very nice to have the, 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 the rules on the books. Do you use them? Enforcement is absolutely critical. And I think on this, there is a lot of progress being made thanks to the OECD, and now they are trying to push the envelope on the bribery convention, on the asset recovery. We have set up a website, Asset Recovery Watch, where we put all the cases that are publicly known about asset recovery as a way for everybody, all of you, to have access to that and to be able to measure progress. But I think continue to push on enforcement, what's happening in practice, and make sure that in front of a systemic issue, you have more than individual cases, but something that begins to make a critical mass remains a challenge. Thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> the financial crisis over the last several years has result in, resulted in um, uh, efforts to increase regulations uh, on the financial industry, the, the, the major banks in particular. Um, a lot of us regard that as an effort that did not produce um, the kinds of results that we would like to have seen. Uh, produced uh, minimal regulations on the banks. Certainly the banks themselves think that they have won uh, their fight against uh, 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 excessive regulation. The optimism that we felt in the Arab Spring produced a similar amount of, of hope that we were going to be able to make a major uh, uh, thrust into the business of uh, fighting corruption. I'd like to ask Frank and Jean, was that optimism justified or has it dissipated? Um. Oh. Jean, why don't you go first? <laughs> <laughs> That, that's a bit unfair. Um, <laughs> um, I would say glass half empty. Um, I think a um, couple of things. In the countries themselves, in Tunisia, in Libya, in Egypt, uh, I mean in other countries beyond the Arab Spring, the on-the-ground demand for action is huge and remains as mobilized as we saw them a year ago. And I think that's really important. And for those who, who followed what happened in Doha, I mean, there was a really good speech by the president of Tunisia, for instance, really expressing frustration, expressing why it was so important to them, but not just blaming the other part, which is, okay, we also recognize that we have our things to play. So I think there is still a momentum that deserves uh, to be sustained, and that is a source of hope. I think there is also big expectation on we want results and not just words. Now, on the other side, I think some of the uh, developed countries, uh, I mean, as you mentioned, I mean, Switzerland, 
acted on the assets of Ben Ali and Mubarak just the day after. They could have acted before, maybe, but the fact that they acted just after at least is a huge improvement compared to the past. So again, I think we are putting the bar much higher. I think what some of the jurisdictions are doing, the UK Financial Services Authority, for instance, has done a horizontal review of what the banks are not doing, actually, on the PEPs, is a huge improvement that would not have happened before. One can say, well, that already happened by, through Abasha. Nothing changed. But at least they are doing that. I think there is still an opportunity. It's not lost. The momentum is still there. But it will require much more... Uh, not doing business as usual than what we've seen so far, and I think we need to continue collectively to push there. Uh, <clears throat> I'm more optimistic. Um, there is a two-page big spread about the book and about corruption in a major Tunisian newspaper this morning. Uh, two years ago, that wouldn't have been the case. Uh, there is more discussion about corruption in the Middle East and North Africa today, and about illegitimate governments and accountability of governments uh, that, that, than ever before. And you saw it coming. I start the book by talking about my visit to uh, Cairo uh, in um, two years before the Arab Spring to a seminar that was supposed to be on the financial crisis, but of course everybody only wanted to talk about corruption. It's been building. So much of what we saw from Occupy Wall Street to the huge demonstrations in India to many, many other places uh, result from the energies that came out of what people saw the brave people of Egypt and Tunisia were doing. And there's much more. We have um, privilege this morning that Lex Riafil is here. Uh, Lex wrote to me uh, a couple of years ago, and it's in the book, um, about how we ought to start watching what was going on in Myanmar. He was there. Uh, at the time, and he saw the stirrings, and he saw that there was even change in the country that comes almost at the very, very bottom of the Transparency International Corruption Perception Index. So in many, many countries, I think the spirit of the brave people are in the streets of Egypt and Tunisia is percolating, is continuing, is adding to momentum, and is helping to create move the anti-corruption movement, as it were, from a somewhat elite to a mass public movement. This is a phenomenal change. I, th I think it is a, we'll look back in 20, 30 years' time, or those of you who were at that, and say, hey, this was an incredible change, and therefore the Arab Spring was a seminal event. Let me go out on a limb a little bit. In our work, and Frank, I don't know if you've had a similar experience, but in our work focusing on illicit financial flows resulting from all sources, corruption, criminality, and uh, tax, uh, commercial tax evasion, in our work we find that the foreign policy communities and the national security uh, communities tend to think that that is somebody else's problem. That's Treasury's problem. That's FBI's problem. That, that's not our problem. We deal in the hard realities of, of policy concerns and, and uh, weapons and uh, so forth. I think that's very short-sighted and have, and have said so a number of times. But I, I find it difficult to crack through um, to, to get people to understand that what we're talking about is a systemic problem that affects everything that you're doing as well in the foreign policy and security arenas. Frank and Ted, um, right or wrong, uh, what's your experience? Well, let me just go first and refer to the book. A considerable amount of this book is about international security issues. Uh, not a considerable amount, but there's a, there are a couple of chapters in this book. The book deals with a lot of the challenges of, corru of fighting corruption and deals with a number of issues from <coughs> development assistance to illicit financial flows to corporate bribery. But it also deals with the issue that you've mentioned because we've had a paradigm for far too long in the strategic international foreign policy community that says to win friends overseas, we turn a blind eye to the corruption in their own governments, whether it's Karzai, whether it was Iraq. Uh, and this, go, this, this really has its origin, well, it has its origin hundreds of years ago, but, but it really came into, uh, to the fore during the Cold War. We have not found a new paradigm to replace that. So therefore, I think the foreign policy establishment rather ignores the problem because it doesn't have an answer. 
I don't have a good answer. And one of the major points I try to make in the book is it is time for the debate. It is time for us to open it up. It's time for us to look at security and natural resources. Uh, it's time for us to look at security and the sales of weapon systems across the world with all those complicated offset agreements that amount in many cases to ways in which governments can steal money. Uh, it's time to look at security and in relationships and how Western governments are culpable here and what they need to do in a new debate, which I'm suggesting here without saying I have the answers because I think this is very complicated, but I think we have to find answers. I don't agree with you on the premise that the foreign policy and national security institutions have ignored corruption. Uh, what you may not see uh, is the fact that they work very hard uh, every day on anti-corruption activities within their own countries, within the countries where they're posted. Uh, it may not be that the results of those things are directly uh, in the newspapers. Same thing with the national security and the intelligence gathering. Uh, it wouldn't surprise you, I'm sure, that uh, uh, electronic and other means of uh, intelligence constantly collect information uh, about corruption. We don't always see what's done. Um, part of the uh, technique that is used to go after uh, uh, corrupt officials uh, much like it is uh, in the drug arena, is to uh, disrupt and deter uh, their activities. Now, as I mentioned to you earlier, the last 10 years, unfortunately, in my view, has been focused only on terrorist financing. I don't say that it's not important, because uh, it, it speaks for itself. But there's a lot been going on. Um, uh, the, for example, there's several initiatives on using uh, anti-money laundering to fight uh, corruption in wildlife crime. So logging, uh, animals, the extinction of several species. All of those take place only because of corruption at the ministerial and presidential levels of certain countries. Uh, a small step, you know, a small step. Uh, there was a case filed by the United States in the District Court of um, uh, D.C. against Mr. Uh, Teodoro Obiang of Equatorial Guinea, the Minister of Environment. Uh, he has um, oh, 35 or $40 million worth of assets in the United States, including the Michael Jackson uh, crystal covered uh, bad uh, tour glove. Uh, that money has been moved to be seized. Okay, but Ted, one second. You know, you read the Inspector General's report on Iraq, and it's, as I highlighted in the book, billions of dollars of U.S. taxpayer money went straight into the secret bank accounts of government officials there. We knew about it. The Pentagon did nothing about it. The White House did nothing about it. Vice President Cheney even said, well, that's fine. Let's, let's just carry on. We've got other priorities. We've done exactly the same in Afghanistan. Right now, American taxpayer money on a huge scale is being shipped from Kabul to Dubai. It's being regularly reported. The Inspector General is also saying that he's finding it difficult to get accounts. These, we're talking billions in the central countries of our that have been central to our foreign policy in the last couple of years. And this issue hasn't come up. I must say, though, in just, to, just to sort of even this out a little bit, Hillary Clinton and, in fact, President Obama get enormous uh, praise from me also in the book for what they've done to encourage civil society around the world to speak truth to power the efforts that they have made. It is a travesty that the Kremlin is now cutting off US aid support in Russia. But, but, let's not confuse all of these nice things since the Patriot Act of 2011 with the reality of what's happened in Afghanistan and Iraq and in these other major geopolitical things where the White House and the Pentagon have allowed vast amounts of our money to be stolen. 
I think that is a terrible tragedy uh, I, that really uh, dwarfs mo many of these other things. But, but that's, 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 that's <laughs> next, uh, next, no, next, no, next, no, next well, well, no, like the presidential debate, I get a, I get a, uh, I get a, I, I get a response. Oh, <laughs> Thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. Two, two things. One, how would you have stopped it? I haven't seen anybody put forward. Criticism is reasonable. Amount of money stolen, outrageous. Shouldn't be allowed. How are you going to stop it tomorrow? I, I wouldn't have gone into Iraq and that's, that's a separate <laughs> issue. Don't, don't <laughs> mix. Right. We no. knew that Karzai was corrupt from the very beginning. The question you can ask is, why, does, why do countries, governments, allow corrupt officials to rise in the first place? OK, 30 seconds. Um, uh, let me ask um, um, one further question, and then we'll open it up uh, to the audience. And it's an extension of this uh, discussion. We've had a huge number of banking scandals. Uh, Standard Chartered, Wachovia, HSBC, Bank of America, UBS, uh, uh, it goes on. And yet, no banker goes to jail. Why? Are we talking about um, just regulatory capture? Are we talking about the impact of money in politics? Um, why? Why do no bankers ever go to jail on these things? Well, first of all, I have to make a disclaimer. Uh, Emily Vogel, who's here, and I, for the last 20 odd years, have uh, represented in a PR since the Institute of International Finance, and therefore the bankers. So um, just so there's no conflict of interest uh, here. Why? Because time and time again, I believe, people have, mis have failed to recognize that these are not victimless crimes. We come back to your comment and my comment earlier. So long as these are looked at as just pure sort of white collar crimes that, that, that have some sort of financial effect or very technical or something like that, um, the punishment will never fit the crime. Once you start looking at the huge damage done to the countries and to the peoples who suffer, who are the victims as a result of these crimes, then I think you will have a quantum change in the way justice is, is done. It's quite interesting, you know, if you look at some of the cases in the last uh, few years in the state of Illinois, um, where the governor is now serving a 14-year sentence, the, large, the longest sentence ever for uh, a US politician in that kind of situation for corruption. It, only in the last couple of years have you heard the judges in those cases start to talk about how the punishment needs to fit the crime because people have suffered. That's a, a real change. I think we need that in the banking, uh, banking area as well. Let me mention, I, I want to mention something because there, there are powers to do things about these banks that have been there for a long time. The question is, who has the political will to do it? I'm, uh, in, uh, I think it was 1986, the Money Laundering Act uh, was amended in the United States to provide for what we call death penalty for banks. Bank convicted of uh, money laundering offense could uh, lose its license or its FDIC insurance, which makes it uh, impossible to operate. Why hasn't that been done? Why haven't cases, so you don't have to prosecute the individual, you prosecute the, the institution. Now, why hasn't that been done in some of these cases is a very good, is a very good question. Uh, the answers are not satisfactory. It seems that now banks, as a result of the crisis, the banks are too big not only to prosecute, but too big to fail. And, and, but on the problem of the individuals, see, the, the, why the bank has a, a manual, as I forget which one of it did, on how to strip out or, uh, information uh, about Iran transactions from its swift wire transfers or swift messages. That's one of the most outrageous things in the world, and in my view, should have resulted in a uh, case against the institution. The institution says in its defense, so you be the judge. Institution says in its, in its defense, but that happened 10 years ago or eight years ago. We didn't know about it then. As soon as we found out about it, we told the government and we threw everybody out that had done the problem. Now, do we take down city, I forget whether it was city or what have you, do we take down Citibank or J.P. Morgan Chase or 
whatever the case may be. It might be, we had this problem in, um, in the savings and loan crisis of, of the early 90s. You had uh, a small bank in a town. Uh, there was insider trading. The bank collapsed. Do you, do you destroy the bank? Uh, and, take, uh, and then people who need access to finance don't have it in a little town in uh, 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 Omaha. What, you know, I think those questions, because when you, you can talk about civil regulation and how to make it impossible, as Dodd-Frank Dodd maybe started to do, for these banks to carry on what they do. Okay, the criminal aspect needs to be pushed by people officials who are politically willing to do it. Let's move on to audience questions. You're first. Hi, thank you. Um, talking about solutions, as in from the, the FCPA uh, perspective, don't you think that the DOJ always settles these cases and that the fact that, sort of say, the, the one thing that we can target is actually US-based corporations and that the fact that the DOJ always settles these cases uh, basically means there is no serious incentive to, to stop the behavior. And then in the case of, say, BAE systems, they were given a free pass by the Prime Minister of Great Britain when the actual corruption was found. And then the last case is, shouldn't possibly, if these companies were actually too big to disbar, if they were actually debarred from uh, contracts, then there might be some real incentive. But at the end of the day, a $200 million fine to BAE systems is nothing. So basically, is there any kind of a answer there? Let me ask Frank alone to respond to that. Yes. Yes, I, I, I write about that at some length. And, and the point was that the settlement with BAE, just as an example in the United States, was so crafted that they could continue to be a contractor to the Defense Department right after paying a record-sized fine. Um, it's, it, we should set that against the fact that today there are more investigations by the Justice Department than ever before. The number is increasing uh, significantly. There's also more in Germany today than ever before. Uh, so the pressure is mounting. But there's a story in the Financial Times this morning that says one out of every four British corporate directors would pay a bribe if, it, if, if that helped them win a contract. So we have to do a lot of education here. It's not just the fines. It's not just the disbarment. We have to go much further, deeper down, and that's maybe a subject for another day. Can, can let, I let, let me go ahead, John, um, just a brief. I mean, and, and, and on purpose, with the non-U.S. perspective, um, I mean, around the settlement, there is also a broader discussion, which is between the way the U.S. systems works in terms of settling against going to the full trial. And there are many legal and cultural differences in that respect. So we need to adapt our reading of that uh, from that perspective. But I think what is really interesting in some cases, and my guess it was on purpose, is how the US DOJ I used the settlement to put pressure on third party jurisdictions so that they go after their own companies. And if you look at the implementation of the OECD anti-bribery convention 10 years ago, it was almost zip except the US. Some countries were beginning to do something, but how the US DOJ has used some pressure through settlement and joint settlement to get the others to begin to act is also an interesting perspective. So then, is it enough? I don't know, but I think we need to look at it also from a broader perspective than just the US. Another question for me. There's an effort underway uh, led by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to weaken the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Um, my father used to be a director of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I also made him a director of my business in, in Nigeria, Nigerian Diversified Investments. And uh, we talked about, he flew many times to Nigeria and we talked about corruption problems uh, all the time. Um, I'm quite sure my father's turning over in his grave at, uh, at prospects of weakening the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act led by the institution of which he was a director for many years. Frank, uh, does that exercise you as much as it exercises me? Um, not really, because it's going to fail. But, but, <laughs> but, um, I, I got into this, I got interested in this whole subject uh, when I came to this country in 1974, in the final months of President Nixon, I came here as a foreign correspondent for the Times of London. And for the next couple of years, one of the stories that I followed hugely 
was the post-Watergate investigations into foreign corrupt bribery, which led to the FCPA, and which is a must-read. It's chapter 10 of my book. It's called, It Started with Watergate. Um, I think anybody who recalls what happened there in the hearings and what some very strongly conservative members of Congress and the administration, including William Simon, who was then Secretary of Energy at one point and, and, and Secretary of the Treasury, had to say about how outrageous corporate bribery was. Anybody who re looks back at that record will say, wait a second, what's going on now needs to be stopped because there is abs because the dangers of this kind of practice are too great. It's all there on the record from the 70s. Dan, you got a question? Uh, a comment and then a question, but I'll make the comment short. Um, you know, I used to be at the Department of Justice in the bank fraud unit. I can only describe, and this was in the late 90s, what I would call an institutional timidity when it came to prosecuting and investigating these cases and the satisfaction of, of getting a fine. Uh, but I think for the reason for this, you have to look at our campaign finance laws, which are now going to become even worse in light of Citizen United, and the amount of money given by large financial institutions to both parties. Okay, actually in the 1996 election, I think more went to the Democrats than the Republicans. So you have to look there. What does that mean? It means that those who are really prosecuting these cases or investigating them are people like Preet Bharara in the Southern District of New York, who is not beholden, at least, to campaign contributions. Uh, it, uh, it wasn't until Mark Mendelssohn really came over and took over the, the FCPA unit that that unit started becoming aggressive. So, so there's not really a lot of incentive from the top, unfortunately, to really prosecute these cases and go after the individuals. So I don't think we're going to make much progress here until there's a fundamental change in the way our campaigns are financed. I wonder if any of you want to comment on that. Let me take another question, and for gender balance, we'll go back here. Um, Jasmine Huggins from uh, Churchill Service. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Frank, for your anger and your passion, which I very much share. Um, I uh, came to Washington maybe uh, 19 months ago and um, on secondment from uh, Christian Aid in Britain, which has been doing some work on corruption, particularly the UN Convention on CAC. And um, uh, as I work specifically on Haiti, uh, which has ratified the convention, we have been trying to look at how we can work with um, within that framework, considering especially that the peer review for Haiti comes up next year. Um, so you mentioned complacency. I'd like to suggest that, based on my experience, there's more than complacency. There's actually ideological resistance, particularly here. Um, I've found it absolutely staggering um, and have not always been able to come up with a response. And so maybe this is a question to you. How do you deal with that kind of resistance? particularly among progressives who feel that the only villains um, that can exist are in the North? And how do you deal with the resistance, with the, the acknowledgement from conservatives and moderates who um, go the other way and say, well, maybe this is um, a justification for cutting off of funds or for excessive conditionality? In, in, in the use of international funding. How can you, so the question is, how can you address corruption without it being captured excessively either by the progressives who disagree with you or the moderates and the conservatives? And how do you, how do you wade through this uh, very complicated political environment? Thank you. Frank, can I ask you to address both of those questions? Okay, I'll be extremely brief because they're huge subjects so that I can't do either of them justice. I agree with you about the United States. I think we've got a since Citizens United ruling, we've got a very serious situation. I try to highlight that a little bit in the book. Uh, Ameri too many Americans think, uh, in, in the sort of in the Washington circle, think corruption is something that happens over there. It's happening here at home, and um, there needs. I, I'm sure there'll be a backlash here, actually, because I think public outrage about this is, is huge. It's going to take time. It's going to be very, very difficult. Um, I think the answer to your question, which is, th there is not a simple answer, but one part of the answer, is people need to recognize far more, particularly in, in many parts of the world, how important civil society is. 
as playing an absolutely central role in, in helping to build institutions, in helping to monitor public expenditure and so forth. I mean, I am quite radical by some people's, uh, I'm sure, uh, some people will think I am, uh, with regard, for example, to the World Bank. I worked for the World Bank for nine years. I was its chief spokesman. I passionately believe in the values of the World Bank and its mission. But they live in Alice in Wonderland world when it comes to good governance lending. They're pushing out money to corrupt governments to co so that those corrupt governments reform themselves. There is something fundamentally nuts about that. Civil society has to be recognized to play a much, much bigger role as a partner and as a monitor in all aspects of this work. And if it isn't, then I think the pace of reform will be slower. Uh, I believe, however, that, that that gradually is actually happening. And we need to do a lot more. The Partnership for Transparency Fund is so important here. We need to do a lot, lot more to push that. PTF has written a terrific book about this subject of, on the demand for good governance. And I think it's important. We're down to our last five minutes. There are an awful lot of questions. Uh, you, sir. Please keep your questions short, and I will try to keep the answers short. Uh, my name is Michael Kasson. I You've got a, bank, you got a I went to the bank in 69 and uh, was also advisor to USAID and then left about 10 years ago. Uh, I've seen a lot of corruption in my time. But I want to really say, Frank, thank you very much. Uh, you and Peter have uh, set up a, on your own, an organization that has done more good with so little than all these other Beltway outfits. So, good day, Mike. Uh, my, uh, there's a piece in the Financial uh, the Economist about India and how the corruption works. 80% never reaches the designates, and it's all skimmed out. But I think what we really have, a very powerful weapon and you touch on it, is a social media. Now, I'm 70, you guys are over 40, all right, so. Anyway. <laughs> so what you've got to do is mobilize the information that's being generated all the time, bring it here, not the top-down approach, keep the World Bank out of this. Bring it here, and then names are, na are named, okay? Name given out. And I think that, that is something that is the most popular, and that the Arab <coughs> Spring showed how good it is. Uh, I was around the, one of the biggest funds in the bank in Pakistan, and uh, it is so corrupt there. I actually, to protect myself, made a list of all the shenanigans that were going on, and I was attacked by the Pakistani government as a whistleblower, typical whistleblower thing. And the guys on top of me didn't want to get involved because the wolf was the, said, thou shalt be client sensitive, which opened the door for corruption in the bank. And finally, uh, I was working with uh, the senior minister in Afghanistan, Hidayat Amin Rasala, who was with me in the bank, and he's really furious at the accusation that it's all the Afghans were at fault. He said, where's the money coming from? He said, all these contractors with AID and the Defense Department, they're the skimmers like crazy. So uh, anyway. Let's get one more question back there. The, the, the lady uh, right there, yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Melissa. I come from Mexico. I consider myself as an activist. Uh, so these all victims addressing part of the corruption agenda. Do you think we are in the moment to cross the human rights agenda and the corruption agenda in order to address correctly all this issue? That will be one question. And regarding civil society, do you think, do you think the open government partnership has a future? I just addressed that question that you ask about the relationship between human rights and corruption, illicit financial flows with the Minister of Development in Denmark uh, on, on uh, Monday. Um, he's, he's very much coming from the same position as you are. Frank, uh, there's another event following this one. We're down to two minutes. The, the, the last word goes to you. Please, Frank. Um, you're right. And I, I try to make this point as well as it is. If you look at the indices on corruption, on human rights abuse, on violence and security in, in the world as well, the, the rankings are almost identical. The countries that come out worse in each case are almost identical. So there is a tremendous amount of overlap. And it, and it goes back to justice and a lack of justice. Um, and so, yes, I think there are efforts being made 
by civil society, but not enough. We all who are involved have to work much, much harder to work with people in the human rights field, work with people in the free press freedom field, uh, because journalists are getting killed and censorship is a massive issue in this that directly relates to our topic. So many of these things are related. But um, we could get very depressed. Uh, we didn't continue our little debate about Pakistan, another case that we should, we should discuss. The point, though, I want to, the last point, because Raymond, thank you so much for doing this this morning. Um, Raymond's work and GFI's work is so important. And my last point is, I think we can win this war, but I think it means we have to end the complacency, we have to convince more people about the terrific achievements of the last 20 years and how we build on it, and build on those building blocks and the stuff that you were talking about in order to make people understand this is not a hopeless cause, quite the opposite. This is vitally important for our civilization. John Pym, Ted Greenberg, thank you very much for your contributions. Frank, what is most stunning about your book is its optimism that we can win the fight. <laughs> thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to everybody for coming. Um, Frank will be signing some books just down the hall.